What's the secret to success to, to double <laughs> your roofing business every year? It's the thing you don't have a process for. It's gonna consume all your time and time is money. Let's talk about you selling the business. How hard was the decision? Yeah. And why did you decide to sell? Everyone thinks you know everything about everything. Well, you don't. You don't know anything about anything, man. <laughs> Kevin, welcome to the show. That's uh, nice to be here, Dimitri. <laughs> <laughs> did, w w did I say anything wrong? Like fast is growing, yeah. residential. I would, I would agree, yeah, yeah. Um, let's go all the way to the beginning. How did you start your roofing journey? What's your background and when did you join the roofing world? Uh, well, as I tell the story, roofing found me. Um, I, I was, uh, it, like a lot of entrepreneurs, I've tried a lot of different things. I graduated college. Uh, mid 90s uh, business degree and you know sought out to make my mark on the world and was in different fields uh, different different uh, finance banking mortgage uh, taxes so a lot tried a lot of things um, and then the, re the big recession hit back in 07 08 and that's when a lot of people in different industries we kind of had to you know figure things out differently so I was uh, I would say I was brought to the industry at a, at a low point in my life if you've ever been in one of those points when you when you find something that kind of wakes you up and helps you get out of it it's it's pretty cool so i got in about i'd say 12 13 years ago by default um i just happened to be at the right place at the right time and um i was able to kind of start and build everything and just kind of do it the way i wanted to do it and the way i thought made the most sense for today right i think that's you know one of the craziest things is everyone there's all these ways of doing business that we all have, right? You have these, they're called rules of engagement. And I always thought it was funny that in certain industries, specifically home service, is that we still have these traditional rules of engagement. Like I gotta get my grandpappy's grandpappy's grandpappy said I gotta get three is estimates. And so when I got in, we had that. And then there was a digital revolution going on as well, where you know there were companies that were able to kind of help you uh, find customers and grow your business. So. That's kind of got in so, by default at a, what I did, consider a start, pivotal time. How did you start? Did you have a partner? Did you start it by yourself? Like basically, uh, I had a business partner we had other businesses with. Um, he was also a general contractor. While we were doing other business, he got his roofing license simply to, to, to offer roofs for the people he was doing a remodel. Never thought of it as a, as a separate business. Um, when some other businesses didn't pan out that we were in, he asked if I wanted to, didn't really know what I, you know, he felt bad for me, I think. And he asked if I wanted to maybe come sell roofs. I had some in-home experience and that's how I got in, man. He, he, he was maybe doing a roof, maybe a, 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 every week, every other week. It wasn't a business. It was part of his overall construction business. And uh, I got in and there were some online lead sources that you could buy potential customers and the rest is history. <laughs> Wow. Uh, how fast did you grow? Like, so you started what, 2008, eight, nine? Yeah. Uh, what man, did you do first couple of years? What, describe uh, to me business early on. Uh, my very first month in the business, I didn't know anything about the business. I was able to, to, to purchase, uh, I think 10 leads of those leads. A lead is nothing more than someone who thinks they might want something, right? Uh, I was able to schedule nine appointments and this is retail. I don't know any, I, I never even heard of an insurance restoration probably until about year five. So straight retail. So uh, I had to figure out how these nine people were going to buy a roof from me, not having any experience at all. And uh, so, you know, you do like you act as if, right? We all say that. <laughs> and I, I sold eight my first month. So to me, getting in front of people, talking to them and convincing them that I'm going to do a good job for you was, was easy for me. Um, it just had to find enough people that wanted to listen to me. You went from a show of one to 300 employees in like, what, 10 years? Very quickly, yeah. 300 employees. Very quickly. What's the secret to success to, to <laughs> double your roofing business every year? Uh, you know, there's no secrets because there's so many little things you got to do right. But uh, you, a lot of people talk about scaling, like scaling, it's a, it's a buzzword, mm -hmm. but no one really understands what that means. So what, what I was able to figure out was that I would scale through revenue. And, and what that means is if I wanted to go and grow, I could, you know, you can only grow so much in your, in your own market, right? So uh, if to, to scale, you gotta be able to say, can I take this and do it there? 
So for me, I said, well, it's revenue. I mean, busy work is busy work. So in retail, like once you you own your market and, and there's a there's a there's a, a cap. There's only so much you can get out of one market. You want to take your show on the road, so you got to have to figure it out. And and the benefit of, and I think I said it before, the digital revolution was you were able to to kind of forecast based on you know some some previous data that somebody has. And so when we would scale in these other markets, we we really knew that we knew that for every dollar spent, this is where we we can trend on being. You just, I mean, you have to have a solid process. You do. Like, like what's the most important thing to have in place before you open second location? Because I see many people open and they close it because they were not ready for it. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's such a tough question. There, there really is not a formula, but you definitely have to know every part of the process. You have to have a process for every part of the process. So <laughs> what that means in my company, no one does too many things. And I learned very quickly that if I would have someone, you know, manage something and they were managing eight things, inevitably the one thing I said, hey, what's going on here? They said, I, I didn't have time. They had seven other excuses. So we realized very quickly that we had a, we call it com compartmentalized. So everyone had a responsibility. So once you have people have specific responsibilities and so, such as scheduling and permitting, you know, our sales guys don't run their own jobs. They're salespeople. They don't need, I mean, that's, that's busy work. So you have project managers and supervisors. Once you have like the, the template built out of what that role entails, you build the process. And the process is five to seven steps that someone really can't screw up. So you kind of have to build those in all your little departments and, and warranty. You saw warranty today, as a matter of fact. Um, you gotta have like a process that, that is built out specifically for that, that particular thing. Uh, because what happens is inevitably when you when you scale in these other markets What's going to happen is the thing you don't have a process for is going to consume all your time and time is money And you want to get you want to get there quickly and, and do it So I mean, it's just it's really having a process for everything and and I and when I brought my, one of my my Leaders who is still running my business down, you know The first thing you can tell if someone has a process is let me see your training manual. Let me see your sales manual let me see your admin manual. Do you have a step-by-step -step way of doing it or is it anecdotal? Well, this is the way we do it, right? Just someone saying, hey, I told this is how you do it. Oh, ask Earl at the shop. He told us how to do how, it. How do you build it? Like, how do you build the process? And how much time did you spend on building the process versus everything else? Well, I mean, it really is not hard once you, you, you it, it's actually quite easy. I do it all the time. Is you take the problem and you say, the problem is usually point A to point B. We're stumbling in here. And then you get really smart people that have done that particular part. Let's say it's, you know, manage a, a, a job site, right? So let's take all the really good people and say, we're going to break it down to five important things. And if you, if you say this, if you do this, these five things only every single time, 98% of the time, I know it's going to work because these are, these, these are irrefutably perfect, right? You show up on time, you introduce yourself because most, most headaches are communication. Sure. No doubt about it. Like today, they did not call you to their company. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So, but that, that's true. I mean, it really is that communication is always the, the, the bigger problem. So process is important, man. I mean, especially in retail because we are in the same place and, and, you know, as opposed to the other side of the industry, which you typically have the salesman's, the project manager and all this, even, even our insurance division didn't do that. They would sell it and we would manage the projects because we want them to be out doing what the most important thing of any ecosystem in the world is what sure. sales revenue, revenue. It makes the world go round, man. You can't live without revenue. So if, if, if you could say the most important part of any business in the world is the revenue, the, the revenue stream, because it is. It's the only thing that matters. Everything else is a problem that you got to fix. What I love about your story is uh, that it shows that there are a lot of money in the roofing. There's great opportunities. This is what made me scale. I will tell you the story. So uh, we had a hurricane, Irma, I think about five, four or five years ago. It was a big hurricane. And I was only in Orlando and here, and we did the year before, we, we were already a big company. I did $30 million, but this Irma came in and hit my two markets and I doubled in overnight, did $64 million. And we did it, we added a lot of jobs. Obviously scaling is, is just adding more people to, uh, you know, to build it. And um, what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to let those people go. I didn't want to hire all these people in my backyard, right? And basically say, yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the money. And uh, so, the, the, I was conflicted and I was talking to him. I said, well, what do I do as a business person, right? I don't need to, I, I don't have, I don't have the energy. I had two hurricanes back to back. We had a hail, uh, uh, we actually had a hailstorm 
after that. But uh, so, you know, my energy level from going out to grow and scale was, was low. It, my intent was, it was pretty, I didn't have to, right? I mean, I already had this house, right? So, but I also didn't want to uh, let these people go. They put in their blood, sweat, tears. You know, we kind of have a theory, one win, all win at my company. So I wanted to figure out how I could, you know, I knew I wasn't going to do $60 million in my two markets again, because it was, it was inflated as a, as a result. So he came in and said, well, we got to get in these other markets. And he started it. He said, you got to do, you either can buy a company or we can merge with someone. And, and he started the exercise for me. And I, I didn't know enough about it. I mean, the crazy thing is when you're a, a, a president or CEO and you understand, everyone thinks you know everything about everything. Well, you don't. You don't know anything about anything, man. <laughs> you just figure it out when it hits you. That's, that's all it is. Yeah. It's not like I have experience doing any of this. I've never done it either. So he was the first to explain to me, well, we got to scale. So when he came down, this was prior to the, mer the, the, the final one, he worked for two, three years and we opened in, you know, we opened in, uh, Tampa, Jacksonville, um, Naples and West Palm almost overnight, right? Cause we had, we had the, the people to do it. So he basically helped save these jobs. So he came in and we went from 60 and I said, man, if we can just do 60 again, I'll be happy. Well, we did 85 that next year. So it was just, it was honestly having someone who has professional business experience, understands law is, is his trade, but just the, what it takes, it's scaling, right? You, you need people, you need money, <laughs> right? And you gotta, it, but we knew the revenue stream because that was the first thing he said, can you do this anywhere? I said, man, I can, I can do this anywhere, I promise you. This so is, that's it, how we came this in. This is so cool, I mean, think about it. The common guys below what you think, give it a like too. Uh, it always helps our videos, but think about it. someone goes and uh, becomes a lawyer and because we we don't have in our country aspirations to be a contractor. <laughs> no. Like as a matter of fact, right now it's our biggest problem. Nobody wants to go in the trades. But when I see that lawyers and people like you come from financial world and start running roofing companies and you know service companies, this is awesome because it's needed. If you do the study, if you study the market, one of the biggest need and needs and the biggest shortages now it's a uh, labor in trades mm -hmm. you know i predict that you know hvac contractors plumbers roofers we are all going to be next lawyers on the pay scale people will pay hundred dollars 150 dollars for skilled trade labor because there's exodus of laborers mm -hmm. nobody is going in and it's supply and demand <laughs> so if you on the crossroads, what to do with your life, you know, do what this lawyer did. <laughs> Join the roofing company, maybe you will be running it. <laughs> Let's talk about you selling the business. How hard was the decision? Yeah. And why did you decide to sell? You love this, you build it, it's your baby, it's growing fast, why sell? I mean, that's a good question. <laughs> well, first let me, we'll take a little journey, right? So first of all, uh, everyone in the world thinks they have something of value that someone wants to buy but very few people really do, right? Something of value is something that is, is a predictable revenue stream, right? <laughs> Everyone in the world, I, I know so many business people that they think the value of their company is somehow related to something that it's means their nothing. idea. Yeah, yeah, my idea. At the end of the day, it's still, it's a predictable revenue stream with a margin, right? Is there profit? Are they successful? Do they have process? So I, I, we never set out to do that, but in, in my journey to bring in the best business people, um, you know, discussions start. And the first of which is you guys have equity. You, you have a, you have a, a value you have an asset, right? Which I never, ever heard anyone say my business was an asset, right? Your business, I think of an asset as my house, right? Well, as your business is an asset, if, if things are predictable. And this was the first time we heard that. I heard that, which makes you feel good. You mean, what does that mean? Well, that means someone's willing to pay for it. Someone will give me money for a business. Like everyone thinks that that, and I agree. I think end game for a lot of people would be that, but you don't set out that way. So when you find out that your business has value that someone might find appealing, it's, you feel great. It's, it's one of the greatest senses of pride in the world. So when we set out, it, like all things that I do is I say, I think we work hard on all things. Meaning we don't have, we don't have it, one idea in, in, plan, in, in mind. We have all ideas. So let's keep them open. So as we were expanding and we knew that we were an asset, that people started contacting us. So we had started the process of saying, hey, well, 
if someone is willing to pay for it, let's, let's at least entertain it. So it really was never something I thought about. It, it kind of just is, is given to you and, and then you think about it. And you know, at the time, this is pre-COVID or no, I think it's, it's after COVID. So things got a lot harder when COVID hit. Um, we, and, and, and the discussions became more real. So uh, you didn't set out to do that. And, and then when you get into it, it was, it, was, it was difficult. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, as you would expect, I mean, it really was emotionally. I would say it was as hard as anything I've ever done in my life because I built it, right? You built it by hand to, to, to know that you don't, and you don't have control over any of it anyway. So when, when you're going through the process of selling it, you're, you're, you're not in it. You're not in there going through charts and everything with people, man. There's lawyers and accountants that do that. Uh, you're helpless and it's, it, it's a tough process. Um, but when you get to that point and then you realize, man, someone's willing to pay a lot of value. So for me, I started thinking, okay, well, if I'm going to sell my company, what's the, how do I go through this process of not, not, cause I didn't, I, I mean, I was already wealthy before. I mean, obviously, you know, more money is always great. So it wasn't necessarily the money. You know, how, what, if, if I'm going to sell, right, what is, what is best for me and what's best for everyone else, right? What is, what is best for the, I think we had 250 employees or whatever at the time. So that's kind of the exercise I went through. And when you sell, I, I think selling a business is a good thing you should probably hit on a lot. I mean, it's very hard, is you can sell in a lot of buckets. You can sell to friends, you can sell to you know, people you know, you can sell to private equity, you can sell to Fortune 500 companies. Every single one of those is different. Mm -hmm. Every single one of those is gonna treat you, you can different. You sell to employees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so for me, I, I had an exercise and I really wanted to be very pragmatic about it and I said, if, if I were going to sell my company, right, and I care deeply about these employees, which I do, um, who do I think or what entity gives them the greatest opportunity to be employed the longest, right? Who's gonna be around in 10 years? Who's gonna be around in 25 years? Who's gonna be around in 50 years? Who's gonna be around in 100 years? And that was the exercise I went through and overwhelmingly it came back to the, to the company I ended up selling it to because you know, they knew about my, they were in our industry in a, in a different vertical, whether my name is on the company or not, but we're a version of my brand be involved in roofing. I, I felt that it gave me the best, the best opportunity.